good buddy, Dr. Lemansky. And uh, where are we? We're in the gondola at North Star in Tahoe. Yeah, we're gonna take the afternoon, have some time on the mountain, record some video, talk about some health topics, and uh, whatever else comes up. So what are we doing here, John? What's the first? Yeah, bit of so pre-ski, you're fasted, kind of fasted? No, I no. ate about two hours ago, but yeah, let's talk about okay. uh, testing blood sugar yeah. and ketones. So we're gonna use the Keto Mojo, uh, which is a great tool. And the benefit of this one is you can check both your glucose and ketones at the same time. Yep. So, um, so uh, you're a big proponent, I'm a big proponent. And now my, you guys my, are my first blood sugar check in a gondola. So nice. I'll cross that off my bucket list. <laughs> That's a weird bucket list <laughs> to have. Um, and I know what's really cool is that Keto Mojo is paired up now with Hensel Call. Yep. So you can just uh, integrate all your data into it. Yeah, we just integrated this meter into Heads Up Hill. I don't think I'm going to have any ketones that show up, but we'll do the test. Yeah. Just you want to do one, John? Or you don't uh, have your meter? Well, I got a... So I'm doing a test with a friend of mine, Jimmy Moore. And so I have a sensor, and I've been running really high. Mine's 97. So I've been doing all our mostly protein diet experiment, uh, where it's three to one ratio protein to fat intake. And normally what I'll do is, you know, 80% calories are fat, so for me it's been a real difficult experiment, and I'm um, day three. My hope is that after we ski a little bit, I'll burn off a lot of the glycogen stores. Same here. And I should be much better off as far as I don't feel good. Which is really weird. Um, yeah. So we'll check back in in a couple yeah. hours after we've gone and done some heavy activity. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting my blood sugar to come down from yeah. 78, ketones to come up. That's the metabolic response I'm looking for. Right. The same with the same with All right, so we're up at the top of the mountain here at North Star, and uh, we're going to do a few runs. We're going to talk a little bit about HRV, kind of heart rate variability. Heart rate variability, what that means is, is a good test that you can use to measure overall stress levels in your system. So. Basically, the simple understanding is that each time your heart beats, there's some variability to it. It doesn't go like a second, a second, a second. There's something called the R to R interval, which varies a little bit. And that variability is dependent on your parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, and your sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. So, so the time between each beat, basically, yeah, it measured in milliseconds, yeah. varies between beat to beat. Correct. And that variance is actually one of the best indicators we have about the stress Overall stress. On, on tax on the body. Correct. So Western society, overall, we're, we're chronically stressed. So it used to be that... Chronically inflamed. Chronically inflamed. So it used to be that, you know, a bear chases you, you run, you get a huge stress response, and you escape or you don't. Either way, that stress re response goes away. Now, with modern living, we're always stressed, especially when you're out in the mountains like this. Are you stressed? Extremely. It's I'm been a tough stressed. day. It's so John and I use this device, yeah. which is, uh, this is a ring you wear, which actually is measuring data from the finger. And this ring is measuring heart rate, heart rate variability, sleep cycle analysis, body temperature, and is there another me metric? Well, their newer version is going to come out with a, a constant HRV measurement, but yeah. those are the major ones. And basically what we're going to focus on is the HRV. So with this ring in the morning you can check your hrv and it gives you kind of a snapshot in time of where you are yep. how you slept the night before are you ready for exercise and i use this with a lot of my clients who are either professional athletes or high level athletes because it gives you an idea of whether or not you're really ready to go hard that day or if you need to take a day off and kind of relax the other really good um, use of hrv is with situations and food per, per se yeah we were just talking about this which is can you take a heart rate variability after you eat a certain food? Can that be an indicator of food sensitivity? Yeah. So general idea, when you eat, it's a very parasympathetic dominant process. Yeah. So you would expect your HRV to, to go up. Higher HRV is actually much better. It's what you want. It means that the variability in your heart rate is much better. Your parasympathetic nervous system is more active. So let's say you eat something like an ice cream you would expect your HRV to go down because that's a very inflammatory type of response. Mm -hmm. You get an insulin response, you get a, a norepinephrine response, and that'll make your heart rate go up. And when it goes up, your variability goes down. So one way that I do it, and you cannot do it with this ring, unfortunately, is you take a, a Polar H, um, chest strap. Yeah, chest strap that you use for exercise, and you connect it to something like Elite HRV or Nature Beat some of these apps that can measure HRV, 
you check a baseline. So in the morning you wake up, you get your baseline HRV, you eat whatever food it is that you think you're sensitive to, and then you check Eggs, it. dairy, so, yeah. corn, all these foods that all are highly foods. inflammatory, you can actually start to take measurements right. for heart rate variability. If it goes down, that's yep. a bad sign. You have right. to normalize certain variables, yep. but that's one way to check your, how your body's Correct. responding to it and come to it. Correct. So, you know, obviously if you're going to go out and eat a slice of pizza, you know that's probably not healthy for you. You know that the response is going to be exactly what you said. But I think it's more important to use it in situations like you mentioned eggs. Yeah. For a lot of people, eggs, dairy, especially if you're keto, low carb, high fat, dairy tends to be a very pro-inflammatory food. It's very high in fat, and so a lot of people will use that as their way to get those fat macros. If you check an HRV an hour and then a two hour post perennial, yep. you'll see what the response is. Either you get an inflammatory response, so that's probably not a meal you want to eat, or you don't, and then you're okay. You got to do it at least seven days in a row. You know, make sure that all the other variables are consistent so you're not like going out on a stressful day, have a meeting, have a presentation, because that's going to throw the variables off. But I think it's very powerful, and I usually will combine that with the glucose readings as well. To make sure that you know what is my glucose response yep. post meal. Yeah, one thing I've noticed just with this is I, I I check my HRV every morning and I can start to see which lifestyle factors mm -hmm. make my HRV go up or down. So even simple things like a couple glasses of alcohol before yep. bed, actually you'll see your heart rate variability really plummet, and you can start to see going to bed too late. Yep. Uh, stressful situations before bed you can actually start to engineer your day-to-day -day lifestyle to improve your heart rate variability which means your body is under less stress so ways you can measure heart rate variability compare that to your lifestyle and then just start to optimize and that's what mm -hmm. that's what biohacking essentially is is yep. that you know we're all individually different yep and so certain things will affect you completely differently like jimmy moore and i are doing this protein yep. diet he's having a very different response than i am i'd be interested in his hrv measurements i know yeah. he has the ring he does have the ring unfortunately and whiskey is not good for my heart rate variability <laughs> i've learned that the hard way you stressed extremely it's I'm been a tough days anyway, anyhow let's so, go uh, do some runs yep Thanks, and we'll John. check back later cool Sugar check. You gonna check you I'm gonna try not to drop my glucometer. Yeah, do not I'm drop that. So delicate procedure. You look like a junkie with your so little. So what was I at before? 78? Yeah, something like that. was about an hour. About an hour ago. So my guess is it's probably gone up. So I think your sugar is gonna go up. Exercise? Yeah, so your body is gonna actually start utilizing some of the glycogen store because your muscles, you know, need sugar. Especially because his ketones are low. So if you had ketones in your system, then you could just use the ketones for energy. So why does blood sugar go up after certain types of exercise? I see that a lot. Yeah, because you actually you need blood sugar for the muscles to actually utilize it to make energy. So they'll go up, and then you'll see after you finish about an hour after you finish exercising, it'll drop much lower than it was before. 76. So it's come down just a touch. All right, let me check mine. I find that if I do extremely intense exercise, that's when my blood sugar goes up. Yep. Just like a light run or like snowboarding, I'm not going to see a huge spike. It's like when I do heavy lifting, high intensity training, I'll see it like shoot to like 120, 130, and then one, two, three hours later, I'll go back down to normal and then keep going. That was 104. Major ones that I would look at would be fasting glucose, and then in the morning you're fasting glucose. That's probably the most important test that you can check. Tells you a lot of information. Fasting insulin is the, probably the second, if not the most important test as well, because that gives you an overall baseline of where you're at. Um, but you have to go to a lab. You have to go to a lab for that. 
you, I know you're integrating LabCorp and I use usually... LabCorp and Quest are both integrated. Oh, you can order fasting insulin on yep. uh, Wellness FX, request a test, private MD labs, go to your favorite website, buy the test, it's 30 bucks, go get it done. And that's what's really cool. Obviously, I'm a doctor, so I'm kind of biased and I think you should work with a doctor, but... I don't know how much value they really add, Doc, sorry about that. I, I completely agree. Doctors are worthless. No. Um, I do think it's important to work with somebody who knows what they're doing, whether yes. it's a doctor or functional medicine, you know, somebody who has experience and not has, you know, not just read a book and, and regurgitating whatever they've learned. You have to really know this stuff because people can get into trouble if they don't know what they're doing. I've so, made a lot of mistakes on keto just yeah. through trial and error. Well, like we talked about the, the vegetable oils. So we have a segment that we recorded about vegetable oils. A lot of people, you know, when you go keto, you say, okay, I'm going to eat a lot of fat. And they don't differentiate the types of fat that they use, and that's a very, very dangerous thing to do because vegetable oils are very pro-inflammatory. They get into your cell membranes, and they're not functioning very properly. The scary thing is vegetable oils are in everything. So, so that's um, a good point, John. I think a lot of people, when they go keto, they get the macro, they get the nutrients dialed in, yep. seeing the weight come down. But if you don't know what's happening in your blood, the, the actual blood tests from a doctor that are going to show you how your cholesterol is responding, how your inflammation is responding, how your thyroid is responding. Absolutely. Because, so, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can lose weight, right? I mean, you could starve yourself, you could do one of those protein shakes, you know, three times a day. And there's a lot of ways that you can lose weight. I don't use weight as my barometer. Okay, we're going to hit the slopes. Test. Yeah, let's do a few runs. Yeah, we're going to hit the slopes and uh, we'll check back in. Extremely, it's been a tough day. You stressed? Extremely, it's been a tough day. You stressed? Extremely, it's been a tough day. We're going to cut this out, right? Yeah, cut this out. Blooper reel. This is great material. Shit! You stressed? Extremely, it's been a tough day. segment of the day here we're going to talk about the top five reasons why things just aren't working yeah so pretty common I get a lot of questions about this I'm sure you do too you know I've been doing this for a certain period of time I've stalled out or it doesn't work for me and usually it comes down to about you know five things and we'd like to highlight those top five things that really make it hard for you to uh, be successful so um, we kind of talked about one already which is calories so do you need to have some sort of calorie calorie deficit in order to be successful um, again the type of calories matter fat calories matter um, how many how many you take but also the type of fat calories like we mentioned before the vegetable oils are very pro-inflammatory so you want to stick with oils that are going to be not as inflammatory saturated fat so butter or ghee coconut oil MCT oil but I see a lot of people sometimes, very simple thing you can do, people are really into the bulletproof coffee, so they'll drink you know, coffee in the morning, a lot of MCT oil, a lot of butter, and they'll say, well, you know what, I'm not, I'm not losing weight. There you go, you probably just ingested like 500 calories. Yep. Liquid yeah, if, calories. If you're on an 1800 uh, base metabolic rate, yeah. you're trying to keep it 1600, and your morning latte or bulletproof is five, six, seven hundred exactly. calories. That doesn't leave you a lot of food in the day, and then you're over on your caloric intake. It can throw off your results. So yeah, and you get a quick, quick absorption of it too. So um, you know, obviously, you want to make sure that you're not um, taking too much protein, too many carbohydrates, and you're really pushing the fat uh, percentage. But be smart about it. So that's one. So number two, I'm just going to say hormones in general. I've always been told by my wife to never say hormones and women in the same sentence, so I'm probably in trouble already. Yep. But hormones play a big, a big role in weight loss, and any woman who's in menopause will tell you she has a much harder time because there's an estrogen effect, there's a progesterone effect, there's a testosterone effect, there's a thyroid effect, and all those things come into play. So if your thyroid function is not proper, either usually hypothyroid, which a lot of people get autoimmune, hypothyroid, Hashimoto's, 
that becomes an issue yep. because you don't have that metabolic rate that you need. So that's very important. So you're doing everything right. Yep. And things aren't working well. Correct. And a lot of doctors will not run all of the thyroid tests. Correct. They'll run TSH, T4. Right. Okay, those look fine, but you actually have to go a couple levels deeper to really make sure that everything is working properly. That's, I think, a really common area that people get stuck. So what are the other ones? Do you want to get into that now? Or? Well, I don't want to get, it's, it's something that would be a very big topic to get into. That would Just get real. a full thyroid panel. But even more than that, so when you go to your doctor and they check your thyroid, they only check your TSH, which is a marker of how much stimulation your thyroid is getting. That range is very big. Yeah. And so if you're in that range, you won't even get a T4. So they do something called TSH with reflex. If it's in the normal range, then they don't check anything else. So what I check is T4, free T4, free T3, reverse T4, reverse T3. And we'll talk about that in another segment of why that matters and why that's important. But the main thing is, yeah. thyroid is one possible reason Correct. why you're not seeing the results you want. Correct, men, older men especially, uh, testosterone. If you don't have good testosterone levels, you're probably not going to lose weight. Yep. Uh, so that's very important. Simple blood tests. Yep. That's why you know I'm a big data person. That's why I'm a biohacker. That's why, as a physician, I, I, it's hard for me to tell people to do something without actually knowing what the response is. So that's why you'll see we're always checking data. And you know the other thing I would mention too is that a lot of times people will tell me that they'll go to the doctor, their levels will be out of out of range, so their TSH, T4 is out of range, they feel fantastic, and their doctor will change the medication because they're going based on the numbers. So you have to make sure that you play the numbers, but also look at, at the person and say, look, how do you feel? If you feel great, well then, you know, those numbers are probably not as good. So that's the second one. The third one? The third one is just lack of activity. I mean, even if you're doing everything right on the diet, I see tons of people who are getting not even enough basic movement to support even just basic metabolic efficiency. So if you're getting, I don't know, a good way to measure that is just simple steps per day. You're getting two, 3,000 steps per day. That's not even enough movement to really keep the body burning calories. So sedentary behavior is, is basically where you're just sitting at a computer, in a commute. Your body is just in a basically a metabolically dormant state. There's, there's no calorie burn happening. So these are really simple things to track. Any activity tracker on the market can make sure you're just getting up off your butt, getting at least three or four miles, five miles of walking per day. Ideally, strength training is also extremely important, lifting heavy things. Yep. And you don't have to be an expert at that. You can just learn some basic functional movements, strength training. Uh, if, if you're physically able, high intensity interval training is awesome. So I see a lot of people who are just doing everything right on the, on the macros and the food and everything. They get zero exercise. They have zero muscle mass on their body. It's not gonna happen. Yeah, so a couple things I'd like to add on that. So exercise, especially what you mentioned about strength training. So people, especially when you're older, older than 60, 65, if you don't have lean body mass, your chance of dying early is, goes way up. That's because you don't have the support system for your skeleton, you get osteoporosis, you fall, you fracture your hip, and you're dead. So that's very important. The hit is very important. High intensity training. So you don't need to go out and work out for two hours. If you do high intensity, Something as simple as run for a minute, walk for a minute. Run for a minute, walk for a minute. Not only do you increase the density of your mitochondria, which is basically the fuel cell of your body, you increase their efficiency. So now you're burning stuff much faster energy-wise, and you have more to burn. So that's very important. The only thing I would mention is that you do not want to say, look, I just exercised for half an hour, I burned 400 calories, so I'm gonna get my protein shake, that's 1,000 calories. A lot of people do that. They'll eat those bars or you know energy drinks or shakes. I see a lot of people fail at losing weight because of that, because basically the caloric intake is extremely low. And there's a big difference between just cardiovascular-based training, yep. walking, running, right. and activity that builds muscle mass. Building muscle mass actually will help bring down blood sugar levels yep. as well. It brings down inflammation. So it's not just, yes, going and breaking a sweat is awesome. You get the endorphins, you get fit, you get healthy, you get movement. But strength training, muscle mass, yep. equally important. I think a lot of people probably avoid that. They may not feel that they're comfortable in a gym. Well, yeah, I think uh, women in, in general, you know, obviously this is kind of a blanket statement, a 
worried about having too much muscle mass, you know, and, and having that build, um, that's really hard to do. Um, the other thing too is you don't need to go to a gym. I mean, you can just do it at home. You have to do push-ups, you know, sit-ups, lunges, use your body weight, do wall sits. Um, you know, I'll do push-ups in the morning with my kids on my back just to get some like extra strength. It's a, it's a good idea, except when they start jumping on your back, and then you know that's makes not, it yeah makes it challenging. But simple things like that. You know, instead of driving to the grocery store or walking there. You know, when I lived in New York, I would walk like 10 miles a day, and then I moved back to California, and I was like, all right, I gotta drive to the grocery store, which is like you know, half a block away. So, just simple things like that. So exercise, body mass, that's number three. Yeah. Uh, number four is sleep. Really, really easy thing to measure, and a huge gap, deficit for a lot of people. So. A couple things with sleep. If you suspect you have sleep apnea, if you have a family history of sleep apnea, if you're overweight, you think you have sleep apnea, your sleep is going to be completely disrupted. You're not getting restorative sleep. That can actually, in some cases, very quickly get you to a metabolic state that's almost like diabetes, when you're very sleep deprived. It also means your body's not recovering properly, and that just puts a lot more stress on the body. So sleep is very, very sensitive. Having a device that can help you track your sleep and make sure that it's high quality, it's not disrupted from constant wake events from sleep apnea, you're getting enough in, in terms of quantity. That actually helps you lose weight, it helps bring inflammation down, it improves heart rate variability. Simple thing I think a lot of people overlook and really easy to measure, really easy to start to tweak. You and I talk a lot about how to improve our deep sleep, yep. how to make sure that it's high quality, high quantity. So that's one thing I think a lot of people may not associate with body composition and weight loss, is actually your sleep. I would say after nutrition, sleep is probably the most important thing you can do to lose weight. So what if someone suspects they have that? What do you do? Yeah, I mean, you can get a sleep study. Basically, you go to a center, usually run by a critical care or pulmonologist. They put you there at night, they hook you up to a whole bunch of electrodes, they measure hypoxia, so does your oxygen level go down? And they have to meet certain guidelines, and if they do, then they get a CPAP machine, which is this... Darth Vader mask. Yeah, and, and you get positive pressure. Basically, what it does is, like, if you put your head out of the window when you're driving, like a dog, and you get that pressure, that's what it does. So it keeps your lungs open. You can get off those machines by losing weight. Everyone in my, yeah. you know, in my family has extreme cases of sleep apnea. Yeah. I've kept my body weight down, and I, I don't have that, but I know that I am genetically susceptible to that. Yeah. So I have to keep a very close eye on it personally. And it's one of the worst things you can have. If you have um, you know, sleep apnea and you don't treat it properly, you get pulmonary hypertension, you get right side heart failure, you get heart failure, you get diabetes. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible way to live. So that is huge. So that's number four. Yep. Sleep. Yep. So we've got uh, properly managing calories. Yep. We've got hormonal, metabolic, thyroid metabolic issues. Yep. We've got lack of activity, poor sleep, yep. so stress. And then we kind of have talked about this throughout our day. Are you stressed? Extremely. It's I'm been a tough day. Where stress many different for formats can affect whether or not you lose weight. So, I mean, I think anybody who's, my perfect example is anybody who's had a baby and, you know, is trying to lose weight and it's a newborn and they don't sleep and so they're up all night and they're stressed out because their baby has colic or something and can't eat properly. Any person who's gone through that will tell you, I cannot lose weight. Um, anytime that, you know, I used to work nights as a physician and I would be, so hungry. Um, not, not only was I not sleeping, but I was stressed you know, beyond belief. And so I would eat like crazy. And the your, thing your that's appetite regulation yeah, is, is, is extremely difficult to control it the is. more stressed you are. And the interesting part is that you don't crave fat, you crave carbohydrates. S salt and, and sugar. And like quick bursts of, of carbohydrates. I remember like in the hospital, I would eat you know, graham crackers which are basically just like sugar and high fructose corn syrup just because I was starving. So stress in many different ways and what can you do to improve your stress? Well, get out and exercise, be in nature, be with friends, get off your iPhone, get off your tablet, you know, connect with people. Social media is great, Advent, you know, technology is great, but we've lost the connectivity with people so our stress level has gone up. So yoga, meditation, yoga, meditation, any kind of spiritual practices. Yep. Gratuity, you know, it doesn't even have to be a spiritual or a religious perspective. 
just being grateful. So what I do with my children is every night before we go to bed, we talk about three things that we're grateful for. It doesn't have to be something crazy. Sometimes they'll say, well, I'm grateful for my you know, stuffed animal. Right. I do the same thing, yeah. have a group chat with you say my the family. Same thing? I'm, I'm, I'm always grateful for stuffed animals. <laughs> I'm also sending gratitude to my family every night. So I've got my family all over Canada, U.S. Yep. So my mom, my sister, my dad, my stepmom. Every night I just send a text message, three things I'm grateful for. Cool. Simple little thing, and it's just like, okay, I'm ready to go to bed. Yep. It feels good. So just little things you can do. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty. I think that's it for this episode. We'll Thank be back you. in the summer. We're yep. going to do another one of these segments out on the water. Yep. Out on the mountain bike. Yep. We'll have some more stuff to talk about. Sounds good. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care. Talk soon. Are you stressed? Extremely. It's I'm been a tough stressed. day. It's a <laughs>